as much as I would like to say, this is clickbait, this is a drill, nothing's gonna be wrong, I'd be lying to myself. I just recently experienced some foundational news that I think everybody should know. Let me say this once, and I'm gonna be clear. This is the biggest news I have ever seen for Ethereum in the past six years. And I am not joking. I dissected the news. I'm going to reference sources. And I am very certain that after listening to this video, you will likely have to make some big decisions. In this video, I'm going to go extremely deep into exactly what happened with this recent MetaMask censorship. Why I think this is so important is because basically everything right now is all about, you know, American sanctions and the consequences of MetaMask censoring people in Venezuela could be bigger than you think. Keep watching. Alex back with another video and yes, I'm gonna dive into what happened on MetaMask. Now I dove deeper than the person on Twitter, okay? There's people on Twitter saying, oh, it wasn't MetaMask, it was MetaMask uh, infrastructure provider Inferia. I looked into that as well. I dove extremely deep. I looked into the physical paper where the America actually, you know, provided the sanctions to Venezuela and the reasons why, and I'm come to the conclusion that I might have to become a Bitcoin maximalist or something. I don't know. But as you can see here, Venezuelan users of crypto wallet MetaMask say they can no longer access it. In a in a hyperinflated country, they can't access cryptocurrency. The only thing they can access is Bitcoin. NFT marketplace OpenSea blocks users in Iran due to these same US sanctions. Um, and again, I just want to be clear, all over Twitter, people are chiming in um, you know, with their own uh, opinion. Uh, and we've had some people come out and, and point out that it wasn't MetaMask, that it was actually uh, Infura, which is basically the, uh, the infrastructure provider um, of MetaMask. Uh, and I just want to say that I think everybody's di like dissecting this little thing and they're missing the big picture. They're missing what's really going on. So I'm going to set the tone straight. I'm going to provide clarity to the situation, and I'm also going to go over the history of Ethereum so you could see how all of this plays together um, and could potentially change my thoughts about censorship resistance on Ethereum. I don't know. You guys tell me what you think about this video. Leave a comment in the comment section below. But first, I have to provide some context. So as you can see here, I've been talking about this in multiple videos, but basically the big, big war here, obviously there's a physical war, but the big war is a financial war. America pretty much bullies every single country um, that it becomes involved with, basically, right? So if you wanted to take down America, essentially you have to attack them financially, right? And, and the best way to do that uh, is by getting people to ditch the USD as the world reserve currency. Because right now, that is their biggest power. Although they have military, they essentially run, run the world by forcing people to use USD and then controlling the printing of this US dollar. So this is a big problem um, for basically everybody else except for America. And if you get people to ditch the USD, and if USD loses credibility, essentially you have taken down America's biggest strength, okay, uh, besides its military strength. So how do you do that? If I wanted to attack America, I would never do it physically. I would do it financially. So we actually saw this act play out in real time. Uh, the first case study was when Canada enacted the Emergencies Act and started banning or censoring banks from allowing these truckers or these protesters uh, to have access to capital so they can get them to go home, right? Um, and again, what happened there? People adopted crypto. Then Russia makes Bitcoin legal, starts a war. And what do we see? More financial sanctions. And again, Ukraine accepted donations in what? Cryptocurrency. It was very clear, right? Um, so 
as we go into more internal and external conflict, we are going to see more adoption because of these sanctions, okay? Um, and people will continue to ditch USD because of the lack of credibility and because they are realizing, educating themselves on what's going on in the world and how these financial sanctions really work, which end result for Russia is a level playing field financially. That is probably the real reason they're going to war right now is to force America into a corner to have to make these crazy decisions. Now, what recently just happened was kind of crazy. Everybody knows Ukraine, you know, had donations accepted in crypto um, and basically nothing else. They, they were like kind of forced to use crypto, right? Um, so they actually talked about an airdrop, right? The snapshot confirmed um, and literally one day later with no real explanation, they canceled it. That's fishy, right? That's kind of weird. Like, you said you're going to do an airdrop. 24 hours later, you cancel it. I usually take 48 hours to make big decisions. These guys are in way, uh, you know, probably way bigger situation than I am. They have millions of people to look at after. Don't you think it would take a little bit longer for them to make a decision? Uh, I think someone forced them into a corner and basically said, you can't run this airdrop. Because if they run this airdrop, we're going to see a mass influx of people into, uh, you know, donating for, for Ukraine or maybe using cryptocurrency in that side of the world, right? Now, literally one day later, America put sanctions, okay, on Venezuela with MetaMask in a hyperinflated country when it comes to the dollar. And I don't think this is a coincidence. I think this is a small test for what's about to happen in the future. I do believe they're going to come out with a bigger test. Now, if we look at the traits of money from Bitcoin, gold, fiat, the biggest in my personal opinion, if you were to boil everything down to one thing, the beautiful part about cryptocurrencies is that it's censorship resistance. Otherwise, there's literally no reason to have a crypto. Censorship resistance or permissionlessness technology, permissionlessness, meaning anyone in the world, no matter the age, no matter the color, no matter your race, does not matter, should be able to use this asset and nobody could stop it. That's the point of crypto. Now, gold is clearly that thing because it never changed since it first started. But it's not always been the case uh, for Ethereum. So if we look, okay, at who owns MetaMask, okay, we could see some kind of interesting stuff here. So again, um, you know, people were calling MetaMask out. Um, and Infura basically says, in response to the concerns we've been hearing, we want everyone to know that we corrected the problem that so many of you have pointed out. And changing some of the configurations as a result of the new sanctions directives from the United States in other jurisdictions, we mistakenly configured the settings more broadly than they needed to be. This was our oversight. And we are grateful that it is pointed out to us. So they just clearly, okay, they just clearly, as you can see right in front of your face, said that they made the, the configurations too broad. So they didn't say that they made a mistake of censoring people. They are going to continue to censor people. And this is clear, okay? So I dove deep and we looked into you know, um, exactly what Infura is. It's basically, um, it's, you know, MetaMask accesses the blockchain via their infrastructure. Um, so if we look into it deeper, Consensus owns Infura, right? And this is where it gets crazy. Consensus is in cahoots with big companies you know, MasterCard, Visa, JP Morgan, right? And basically 80 to 90% of all Ethereum infrastructure, including Uniswap and some of the biggest decentralized exchanges you know, uses Infura. So what does that tell you? Well, it tells you that the entity that controls most of the infrastructure on Ethereum is run by the centralized entities we're trying to get away from. That's what it tells you right there. We can dive into the specifics and how you can change the custom RPC on MetaMask, like everybody else is talking about on Twitter. Let's talk about the specifics, change the custom RPC. We could say that, but at the end of the day, they are all owned by the same centralized entity. And as you can see here, consensus lawsuit reveals JP Morgan owns critical Ethereum infrastructure. So these centralized entities that we all hate so much and are trying to get away from because they abuse their power essentially owns critical infrastructure in MetaMask and Fura and a lot of other Web3 applications that you guys likely use. So again, if we look at the original sanction that they put out in Venezuela, you can clearly see blocking property of transnational criminal organizations. Now, it's not the first time they've done this. They are basically allowing themselves to block people from transacting their own property or their own money. 
and they get to choose who is a transnational criminal organization. Basically, they do this all the time, right? They do this. We've seen this with even other wars. Okay. And again, I'm, I live in America and I'm proud of my country, but let's just be real here. They have this strategic stronghold on finances um, and economy, right? And the economy of the world, and they keep abusing the power. So I just want to show you proof. Look, Ukraine said they were going to do an airdrop. And literally one day later, um, after careful consideration, we decided to cancel an airdrop. And they're going to actually launch, um, they're going to launch an NFT instead. So that's kind of bullish for NFTs. But again, the infrastructure behind the NFTs, the infrastructure behind the fungible tokens is kind of scary. And I, let, me, let me point it out a little bit and exactly what I mean. So if you dive a little bit into the history of Ethereum, you will get what I'm saying. Around this point right here, we had a DAO hack. So we had a decentralized autonomous organization on Ethereum in 2016, and basically it got hacked for, for a lot of money, millions of dollars in the current value of Ethereum. So right now it's way more than that. Um, so all of the organizations got together and they actually forked Ethereum, okay? And in this case, when they forked Ethereum, and let me explain what a fork is uh, before we actually go further. Let's talk about how centralized entities upgrade their apps and I'm going to explain to you the difference between a hard fork and how you regularly, you know, upgrade an app on your Apple iPhone or whatever the case is, right? So let's say you have an app on your iPhone and you have to upgrade it. Apple gives you terms and conditions, okay? So you can either go two ways. You can accept the terms and conditions, what most people do without reading because no one wants to read a five-page terms and condition page before they can, you know, use their phone. And then your, your app updates, or you don't have to accept it. They don't allow you to update it. And eventually the app starts, stops working. And we see this with iPhones as well. If you have like a really old iPhone, it starts becoming like exponentially worse uh, because they kind of force you into a corner and force you to use the new iPhones. Now, if we look at Ethereum, it's very similar. So we have the regular Ethereum. They had the DAO hack or a fork in the road where one part of the organization was basically like, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna upgrade Ethereum because of this issue. Okay. And, you know, we're going to move to the new ETH. Now, if you look at the actual votes at that time, it was like 97, 98% voted yes to forking Ethereum. 97, 98% voted yes. So the consensus was yes, let's upgrade to the new Ethereum. So basically users get rewarded two tokens. You get the Ethereum classic and then you get the new Ethereum, right? Um, and this is how it's upgraded. It's called a hard fork, right? And both are created. Um, and which brings me to the next part. Basically, there's three main categories. We have community, infrastructure, and ex exchanges, right? So the community is obviously us. We're the people, right? And when you, there's a fork in a road, you basically have a choice to make. If there's a hard fork, you could choose to keep the old coin and sell the new coin or keep the new coin and sell the old coin or keep both coins. You could do anything you want. So you kind of choose which one that you want to adopt, right? That, that part right there is by far, in my personal opinion, the most powerful because the infrastructure essentially gets paid by the community. The, if the community is not using the, the, I guess you could say the new upgrade, um, then you know uh, the infrastructure will have no choice but to go back to the old upgrade. So personally, I think education is the most powerful thing. The more you educate people, the better it gets. So share this with somebody in cryptocurrency that doesn't understand what's going on and maybe uh, looks at the surface level and they're looking at tweets, share this with them so that you can educate them for if potentially a hard fork or some type of serious event happens, you get what's really going on. But the second most powerful part is, of course, the infrastructure. This is the coin websites like CoinMarketCap. This is the miners. This is the coin exchanges. This is, you know, blockchain development tools, right? And, which is like Infuria, right? Which we're seeing right now and MetaMask, the wallets, right? This is the infrastructure. And they have to basically make the decision who am I going to provide infrastructure to? The new coin or the old coin? Okay. And this is what's scaring me because as you can see, the infrastructure is clearly centralized. Remember, if you go back to the, the actual fork date or the DAO hack, it was like 97%. Every, basically all infrastructure, all of the community said they wanted to upgrade. And this was not the case for Bitcoin, which I'm going to show you Bitcoin's history and why Bitcoin has been very censorship resistant. But again, if we come back over here, right, and there's a third part, which is the exchanges. This is Coinbase, and they can choose whether to list this new coin or to keep the old coin, and they could choose, right? And if we look back again at the Ethereum DAO uh, hack and the hard fork that came from the DAO, basically all of these entities, okay, 
chose the new Ethereum or the upgraded Ethereum, and the community basically had no choice but to move over to it. Um, so that was kind of like the weird part about that, again, is that when when that fork happened and a new one was chosen, it was almost like the people made a decision that you can upgrade Ethereum. In the future, everyone knew that you can fork Ethereum successfully and you could upgrade it. But this was not the case for Bitcoin. So there's been multiple forks on Bitcoin. We had one here, Bitcoin XT fork. We had the Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin SV fork. This was the most hardcore one where all of the infrastructures colluded against Bitcoin. Most of the infrastructure, including Coinbase, uh, there's even a conspiracy that Bitbam, Bitmain miners had a little chip inside of them that automatically switched to the new version to provide infrastructure for Bitcoin Cash. There's this whole thing that went down. You guys can go research that for yourself. But when they forked around this time, they chose the old Bitcoin, the old original Bitcoin, the censorship resistant Bitcoin was chosen. And if you look at why Bitcoin was supposedly upgraded, it was trying to make it more centralized. They were essentially trying to increase the block sizes, which would only allow big infrastructure places to mine Bitcoin. So it would essentially make it harder to mine Bitcoin and only allow these very, very rich entities to do the mining. Um, and it will centralize mining, which will ultimately centralize the blockchain in general and make Bitcoin way more controllable. So around this time, okay, it happened to be that when there was a fork in the road, right? If I bring it up here, when there was a fork in the road, and let's just say this Bitcoin, the old Bitcoin was accepted, not the new one. And it forced the infrastructure and exchanges. The community went to the old Bitcoin and it forced the infrastructure and exchanges to adopt the old one. And Bitcoin was never changed. Now, the point I'm trying to make here, I'm going to bring it home for you guys. And I promise you'll understand what I'm saying. If infrastructure on Ethereum, right, if all of these entities are like 97% owned on Ethereum by JP Morgan, Visa, MasterCard, the same entities that screwed us over in the beginning, what makes you think that they just can't upgrade Ethereum or censor people again in the future? This event that we just recently experienced in Venezuela is the perfect representation that Ethereum is not censorship resistant. And in times of war, and if America wants to throw its power around, and let's say hypothetically America points its gun at the biggest entities on Ethereum, I'm willing to bet, and I know this for certain, they will fold under pressure and they cannot do this to Bitcoin. And that is the point of Bitcoin. So I want to give you guys a solution. All right. I know this is like a very negative thing, but I have to let you know the deal. It's getting to the point for me where I don't feel safe with my money on Ethereum. I don't know for sure if I'm going to take it off. I will let you guys know uh, if I go full Bitcoin maxi. <laughs> you guys know I'm a profit maxi. I'm a profit maxi. And in times of war, when we contract as world, it's not really about making as much money as possible, but more about conserving your wealth, uh, you know, conserving what you have. So moving into Bitcoin, to be honest, is not a bad idea uh, if you want to be, uh, if you want to conserve what you have. Um, so Again, I don't think I'll ever be like a, a complete total Bitcoin maximalist, but I think this is very interesting. If you go to impervious.ai, basically they're creating uh, smart contracts and systems on the Lightning Network for Bitcoin. Um, and they have some very, very interesting features. Imagine Zoom without Zoom. Imagine Google Docs without Google. Imagine Medium without Medium. WhatsApp without WhatsApp. Essentially the non-replaceable Bitcoin infrastructure right? The one that survived multiple forks and was not changed. And it kept the original vision of Satoshi Nakamoto, the one that is truly censorship resistant, is going to have another Web3 being developed on it. And in April, the Bitcoin conference that I am going to, they are going to officially launch this new solution, solution to censorship, right? Solution to censorships on social media, solution to censorships on wallets, right? Cryptocurrency wallets. And I really think that this is the tipping point for, for cryptocurrency and the world. Again, I think the biggest pain point for America is people losing credibility or losing trust in America and moving over to the next best thing, which we know for a fact is cryptocurrency and it's shown time and time again when a country is in hyperinflation like venezuela they move to bitcoin when a country is in war they accept donations in bitcoin when people 
are losing faith in the government. They move towards Bitcoin. And hopefully this video gets shared because I highly doubt they're going to allow me to push this on the internet. So do me one quick favor. Click the like button. Leave a comment below what you think. And tap that share button and share it with three people that you think should know this information. Again, I'm changing. You should change as well. All right. You should change and understand what's really going on. We do love, okay, all of these decentralized apps and we all want the next best thing. I get it. You want to make money. You want to buy into these altcoins. But uh, I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. 95 to 99 percent of all of these altcoins are centralized. And when stuff hits the fan, where's your money going to go? It's as simple as that. If you like the quality of this content, hit like. If you don't, leave some constructive criticism. Subscribe for more video updates. And like I always say, if you don't get with it, you will get left behind. Thanks for watching this video, guys. Catch you in the next one.